The Virgin Mary, the biological mother of Jesus, is the most important woman in the Bible. Mother Mary is the most significant person after Jesus Christ in the mystery of redemption. She is the one who truly and cooperated in the redemption of her son Jesus. Mother's vocation and mission are the vocation of co-redemptrix. From time immemorial, God intended to give Mary the grace of co-redemption. Although it is a central figure of Christianity, venerated under various titles such as virgin or queen by millions of people, we know very little about her life. The Bible says very little about her life. The information we know about Mary is mainly related to Jesus. But the life of Mother Mary is much more meaningful than what we know. Right now, I will reveal to you 11 things that very few people know about Mother Mary and the reasons why Mary became the most worshipped woman in the Bible. If you find my video interesting, please click the subscribe button to my YouTube channel. Thank you. 1. First, the origin and meaning of the Virgin Mary's name. The name Mary is of Hebrew origin and has a deeply symbolic meaning in the Christian tradition. Derived from the Hebrew Miriam, the name Mary has been used for and has a rich history in religion and culture. In Hebrew, the meaning of the name Mary is related to the word sea, suggesting a connection to the ocean or sea. This association can have several symbolic meanings, including the idea of greatness, immensity, and abundance. The sea can also represent life, renewal, and purification, reflecting the spiritual importance and role of Mary in the Christian tradition. In the context of Christianity, Mary is a central and revered figure. She is known as the mother of Jesus, the Son of God, and her role in salvation history is fundamental. Her faith, humility, and obedience to God's will are highly esteemed. The name Mary also carries with it a connotation of purity and grace. In the Christian tradition, she is regarded as the Virgin Mary, a figure of purity and virtue. Her virginal conception and her role as the mother of Jesus make her a symbol of divine grace and spiritual motherhood. The name Mary is closely associated with Marian devotion, which is the veneration and worship dedicated to the Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church and in some Orthodox Christian traditions. The faithful express their love and reverence for Mary through prayers, devotions, and acts of veneration, acknowledging her unique role in salvation history and her ongoing intercession before God on behalf of humanity. 2. Second, Mary and the Miraculous Pregnancy of Jesus the process of Mary giving birth to Jesus was extremely miraculous, but because of this, her husband, Joseph, accused Mary of adultery and almost left her. The pregnancy of Mother Mary and the birth of Jesus is described in detail in the Gospel of Matthew. This is also the book that mentions the name of the Virgin Mary the most. The Virgin Mary's Marriage with Joseph Mary resided in her own house in Nazareth in Galilee, possibly with her parents and during her betrothal, the first stage of a Jewish marriage. Mary was only 14 years old when she married Joseph. The question of Mary's age at the time of her marriage is the subject of debate among scholars and theologians, as the canonical Gospels do not provide precise details about this aspect of her life. However, some conclusions can be inferred based on the Jewish culture and customs of the time, as well as contextual information provided by other historical sources and religious traditions in the historical context of 19th century Palestine. It was common for Jewish women to marry at an early age, usually after puberty. Young Jewish girls were considered fit for marriage between the ages of 12 and 14, although on some occasions it could be even earlier. The family and community played an important role in the choice of the husband and the organization of the marriage. Considerable importance was given to the virginity of the bride and to the ritual purity before marriage. Although the Gospels do not specify the age of Mary at the time of her marriage to Joseph, Christian tradition has often taken her to be a young woman in her teens or around the age of 14. This interpretation is based in part on the Jewish cultural context of the time and the common practice of entering into early marriage. In addition, the idea that Mary was young at the time of marriage aligns with the gospel narrative about her engagement to Joseph and the birth of Jesus. It is important to keep in mind that traditions and beliefs about Mary's age can vary between different branches of Christianity and between different cultures and religious communities. The marriage was preceded by the betrothal, after which the bride legally belonged to the bridegroom, though she did not live with him till about a year later when the marriage was celebrated announcement of the conception of Jesus by the Archangel Gabriel. 
the angel Gabriel announced to her that she was to be the mother of the promised Messiah by conceiving him through the Holy Spirit. And after initially expressing incredulity at the announcement, she responded, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done unto me according to your word. Joseph planned to quietly divorce her, but was told her conception was by the Holy Spirit in a dream by an angel of the Lord. The angel told him to not hesitate to take her as his wife, which Joseph did, thereby formally completing the wedding rites. Since the angel Gabriel had told Mary that Elizabeth having previously been barren was then miraculously pregnant, Mary hurried to see Elizabeth, who was living with her husband Zechariah in the hill country, a city of Judah. Mary arrived at the house and greeted Elizabeth, who called Mary the mother of my Lord. Mary spoke the words of praise that later became known as the Magnificat from her first word in the Latin version. After about three months, Mary returned to her own house. The birth of Jesus. According to the Gospel of Luke, a decree of the Roman Emperor Augustus required that Joseph return to his hometown of Bethlehem to register for a Roman census. While he was there with Mary, she gave birth to Jesus, but because there was no place for them in the inn, she used a manger as a cradle. It is not told how old Mary was at the time of the Nativity, but attempts have been made to infer it from the age of a typical Jewish mother of that time. Mary Joan Wynne Leith represents the view that Jewish girls typically marry soon after the onset of puberty. According to Amram Tropper, Jewish females generally married later in Palestine and the Western Diaspora than in Babylonia. Some scholars hold the view that among them, it typically happened between their mid and late teen years or late teens and early twenties. After eight days, the boy was circumcised according to Jewish law and named Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation. After Mary continued in the blood of her purifying for another 33 days, for a total of 40 days, she brought her burnt offering and sin offering to the temple in Jerusalem, Luke 2.22, so the priest could make atonement for her. They also presented Jesus as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, Luke 2.23, Exodus 13, 2, 23, 12, 15, 22, 22, 20, 29, 34, 19, 20, Numbers 3, 13, 18, 15. After the prophecies of Simeon and the prophetess Anna in Luke 2, 25, 38, the family returned into Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. This story of Mary was first told in the New Testament, but more surprisingly, this story was mentioned in the Old Testament, specifically in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel Isaiah 7.14. The location where Mother Mary gave birth to Jesus was accurately predicted by the prophet Micah, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans B of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Micah 5.2 3. Third, the payment to marry Mary. The payment of the bride price is a term that refers to an ancient Jewish custom related to marriage specifically mentioned in the Bible in the context of Joseph and Mary, the earthly parents of Jesus Christ. This event is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew 1, 18, The payment of the bride price, known in Hebrew as Mohar, was an integral part of the Jewish marriage process in biblical times. It consisted of a sum of money or goods that the groom paid to the bride's family as compensation for taking her as his wife. This practice was not a price for the bride, but rather a gesture of honor and recognition towards her family. The payment also served as a guarantee that the groom was committed to his future wife and would be responsible for her well-being. In the biblical account, Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, discovered that she was pregnant, but he knew that he was not the father of the child. In the Jewish culture of the time, the betrothal was a legally binding step toward marriage. Similar to marriage itself, and breaking it required a formal divorce. When Joseph learned of Mary's pregnancy, he initially considered divorcing her privately to avoid exposing her to public embarrassment. However, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and revealed to him the true nature of Mary's pregnancy, explaining that the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She would give birth to Jesus, the Savior of the world. The angel urged Joseph not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. The importance of this event in the biblical account lies in the fact that Joseph, despite the puzzling circumstances, decided to obey the angel's message and take Mary as his wife. Thus he fulfilled his role in the divine plan of redemption. 4. 
fourth Mary and Joseph were descendants of David. Both Mary and Joseph were descendants of David's house and lineage, which was crucial according to the Hebrew scriptures for the Messiah to come from the royal line of David. This has deep significance in the context of biblical history, particularly in relation to the fulfillment of messianic prophecies and the role of Jesus Christ as the expected Messiah. Jesus' descent from David is specifically mentioned in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Matthew records the genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to Joseph, the husband of Mary, emphasizing his legal role as a descendant of David through Joseph Matthew 1.1.17. On the other hand, Luke presents the genealogy of Jesus from Adam to Joseph but clarifies that Jesus was not Joseph's biological son but was conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb Luke 3.23.38. Since Joseph and Mary were engaged, their family lineages would be closely related. This is especially significant in Jewish culture, where marriages generally occurred within the same tribe or family group. Therefore, we can infer that Mary was also of Davidic ancestry. Although her genealogy is not explicitly recorded in Scripture, the fact that Mary and Joseph were both descendants of David fulfills Old Testament prophecies that announced that the Messiah would be in the house of David. For example, in Isaiah 11.1, it is prophesied, but a shoot will sprout from Jesse's trunk, and a scion sprout from his roots. This establishes the connection between the Messiah and the line of David. Likewise, Jeremiah 23.5 declares, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will raise up David, a righteous shoot, and a king will reign, who will be blessed, and will do judgment and righteousness on earth. The fulfillment of these prophecies in Jesus' genealogy confirms his messianic identity and his legitimate claim to the throne of David. This royal lineage establishes Jesus' legitimacy as the promised king and highlights God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises throughout history and his sovereignty in the plan to redeem mankind. The descent of Mary and Joseph from the line of David is a fundamental aspect of salvation history. This descent fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament and establishes the legitimacy of Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah and the eternal King. This royal connection reinforces the identity of Jesus as the fulfillment of the hopes and promises of the people of Israel, as well as his role as Redeemer and Savior of the world. 5. Fifth, Mary is the heavenly woman in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Mary is mentioned indirectly through a symbolic figure known as the heavenly woman. This passage, located in Revelation 12, presents an apocalyptic vision that includes this woman, who is described as a celestial figure of great importance in the context of the conflict between good and evil represented by the dragon. In Revelation 12, 1, 6, the vision of a woman who appears in heaven clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head is presented. This parallels Joseph's account in the book of Genesis, where he dreams of the sun, the moon, and eleven stars bowing to him, representing his family. In the context of Revelation, the heavenly woman is commonly interpreted as a symbolic representation of the Church, or the people of God in its entirety. Some interpreters see the heavenly woman as a personification of the Church, the body of believers redeemed by Christ. The solar garment, the moon under her feet, and the twelve stars can symbolize glory, subordination to Christ, and the twelve tribes of Israel, respectively. This interpretation emphasizes the role of the Church in the story of redemption. Others interpret the heavenly woman as a symbolic representation of Israel, God's chosen people. The image of the woman would reflect the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament and her role in salvation history. In this interpretation, the twelve stars could represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Some theologians and leaders of the Catholic Church interpret the heavenly woman as a symbol of the Virgin Mary herself. According to this interpretation, the figure of the woman represents Mary and her role as the mother of Jesus, the Redeemer. The vision of her pregnancy and childbirth would be a representation of Jesus' birth, and the persecution by the dragon would reflect the spiritual struggle that took place around the birth of Christ. This interpretation highlights Mary's unique role in God's redemptive plan and her status as the spiritual mother of all believers. However, it is important to note that the symbolism and interpretations of the heavenly woman in Revelation can vary among different Christian traditions and scholars. Some may emphasize one interpretation over another, or combine aspects of several interpretations to gain a deeper understanding of the passage. In summary, the mention of Mary in the book of Revelation is through the symbolic figure of the heavenly woman. This figure has different interpretations, 
including that of the Church, the people of Israel, and the Virgin Mary herself. The symbolism and meaning of this passage highlight the complexity and richness of the imagery in Revelation and its connection to salvation history. 6. Sixth, Mary is the Second Eve in Christian theology. The Virgin Mary is often called the Second Eve or New Eve in Christian theology due to her role in the redemption of humanity through her obedient response to God's will. This title highlights the contrast between Mary and Eve, the first woman in the Bible, and emphasizes Mary's unique role in the history of salvation. The idea of Mary as the Second Eve finds its roots in early Christian writings and theology. In the account of Genesis, Eve was created by God as the first woman and lived in the Garden of Eden with Adam. However, Eve disobeyed God's command by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which led to the fall of humanity and the entrance of sin into the world. This act of disobedience had profound consequences for all mankind. In contrast, Mary is presented in the New Testament as a model of obedience and faith. When the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would conceive and give birth to Jesus, the Son of God, Mary responded with humility and acceptance, saying, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, according to thy word, Luke 1.38. This act of surrender and obedience to God's will is seen as a reversal of Eve's disobedience. The writings of early church fathers further emphasize the parallel between Eve and Mary. For example, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, an influential early Christian theologian, described Mary as the new Eve who, through her obedience, undid the effects of Eve's disobedience. St. Irenaeus wrote the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by Mary's obedience for what the Virgin Eve bound through her unbelief. This is the Virgin Mary loosed through her faith. This theological concept underscores the idea that Mary's obedience to God's plan brought salvation and redemption to mankind, just as Eve's disobedience had brought sin and death. Mary's role as the second Eve is also highlighted in Catholic teachings and devotions. In the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, the Catholic Church teaches that Mary was conceived without original sin, emphasizing her unique purity and sinlessness. This belief underscores the idea that Mary was specially chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus, and to play a crucial role in the plan of salvation. Mary's role as the Second Eve is not only a theological concept, but also has practical implications for the lives of believers. She is seen as an example of humility, faith, and obedience, and her intercession is sought by Christians in their prayers and devotions. Mary is regarded as a spiritual mother who cares for and prays for the faithful, helping them to grow in their relationship with God. In summary, the Virgin Mary is called the Second Eve in Christian theology due to her role in the redemption of humanity through her obedient response to God's will. This title highlights the contrast between Mary's obedience and Eve's disobedience, emphasizing Mary's unique role in salvation history. Through her faith and humility, Mary is seen as a model for all believers and as a central figure in the Christian tradition. 7. Seventh, Mary was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. The presence of Mary on the crucifixion of Jesus is a theme of profound significance in the Christian tradition, particularly in the Gospel narrative. Although the biblical accounts do not provide an extensive description of Mary's participation in the crucifixion, her presence at that crucial moment is considered symbolic and theological. In the Gospels, specifically in the Gospel of John, the presence of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned alongside other women on Calvary during the crucifixion. John 19, 25, 27 says, Next to the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, who was there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that moment on the disciple received her into his home, John 19, 25 to 27. This passage reveals that Mary was present during Jesus' crucifixion, thus showing her courage and loyalty by remaining with her son for one of the most painful and distressing moments. Mary's presence on the scene also highlights her deep suffering as a mother when witnessing the agony and the death of her son. Mary's presence at the crucifixion is also interpreted as a fulfillment of prophecy and a testimony to her unique role in the divine plan of salvation. From the moment of the Annunciation, in which the angel Gabriel announced to Mary to conceive the Son of God. Until the crucifixion, Mary was intimately linked to the mystery of human redemption through her son Jesus. Moreover, Mary's presence at the crucifixion highlights her role as mother of the church. 
When Jesus entrusts John with caring for Mary as if she were his own mother, a spiritual bond is established between Mary and all believers represented by John. This action of Jesus emphasizes Mary's maternal care for the Christian community and her ongoing intercession for all of her spiritual children. Her presence at that crucial moment is a reminder to Christians of the importance of her role in the story of redemption and her ongoing intercession in the life of the church. Eight, eighth, transit or dormition of Mary. The transit of Mary, also known as the dormition of Mary or the assumption of the Virgin Mary, is an important theme in theology and Christian tradition, especially in the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, and some Protestant denominations. It refers to the event in which, according to Christian belief, the Virgin Mary, mother of Jesus Christ, was taken to heaven body and soul after her death. Belief in Mary's transit has strong roots in the apostolic tradition and apocryphal writings such as the Transitus Mariae. The doctrine of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven was officially proclaimed as a dogma of faith by Pope Pius XI in 1950, affirming that the Immaculate Mother of God, the Ever-Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. In the Catholic Church and many Orthodox churches, the Dormition of Mary is celebrated on August 15th of each year. This feast day is an influential occasion for Marian veneration and reflection on Mary's unique role in the history of salvation. Mary's assumption is closely related to her role as the Mother of God in her cooperation with the divine plan of redemption. Belief in her assumption highlights her special role as the first and most perfect of Christ's followers, as well as her victory over sin and death. Some theologians have seen Mary's assumption as a fulfillment of biblical typology, especially the figure of Mary as the New Eve and the Ark of the New Covenant, which reinforces her unique role in salvation history. Belief in the Assumption of Mary has been an important point of popular devotion in the Catholic Church and Christian spirituality in general. Many faithful turn to Mary's intercession, trusting in her closeness to Christ and her role as pediatric of all graces. 9. Ninth, the visit of the Magi and the flight of Jesus, Joseph and Mary to Egypt. According to the biblical account, a group of wise men from the East came to Jerusalem, asking for the King of the Jews who was born Matthew 2.1.2. These men, known as the Magi, had seen a special star in the sky that they interpreted as the announcement of the birth of a great king. Their arrival in Jerusalem and their search for the newborn child caused a stir among King Herod and the inhabitants of the city. Despite not being Jewish, the Magi traveled a considerable distance to adore the baby Jesus and offer him symbolic gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This worship anticipates the universal recognition of the divinity of Jesus Christ. The arrival of the Magi and their quest for the King of the Jews fulfilled Old Testament prophecies that the nations would come to worship the Messiah Isaiah 63, Psalm 72, 101. While the Magi showed faith and worship toward Jesus, many Jewish religious leaders represented by Herod reacted with fear and disbelief faced with the news of the birth of the Messiah. After the visit of the Magi, an angel of the Lord warned Joseph in a dream about the danger posed by Herod. He ordered Joseph to flee to Egypt with Mary and the baby Jesus to protect them from the wrath of the King Matthew 2, 13, 15. Joseph obeyed immediately and left for Egypt with his family, where they remained until Herod's death. Matthew mentions that the flight to Egypt fulfilled Hosea's prophecy out of Egypt I called my son Hosea 11, 1. This reference shows how Jesus' life was in line with the Messianic prophecies, confirming his identity as the promised Messiah. The stay of Jesus' family in Egypt is parallels with the story of the people of Israel, who had also fled to Egypt to escape famine in the time of Joseph Genesis 46-47. This parallelism reinforces the connection between Jesus and the people of Israel, as well as his role as the new Moses and spiritual deliverer. The flight into Egypt shows God's providential care for his child, ensuring his protection and preservation to fulfill his redemptive mission. This experience also reflects the reality that Jesus would share the experience of the Jewish people, including exile and persecution. 10. Tenth, the Protoangelium of James and the Childhood of Mary. The Protoangelium of James is an apocryphal text that offers details about the early life of the Virgin Mary, her parents, and her childhood, which are not mentioned in the canonical Gospels of the New Testament. This text, also known as the Gospel of James or the Infancy Gospel of James, is considered part of the New Testament Apocrypha, meaning it is not included in the official canon of the Bible. However, 
it has had a significant influence on Christian tradition and piety. The Proto-Evangelium of James dates back to the second century ad and provides a narrative about the birth and early life of Mary, as well as the events leading up to the birth of Jesus. Although it is not considered historically reliable, the text has been important in shaping the popular imagination and devotion to Mary throughout the centuries. According to the Protovangelium of James, Mary's parents were named Joachim and Anne. They were a pious and wealthy couple, but were childless for many years, which caused them great sorrow. However, through fervent prayer and divine intervention, Anne miraculously conceived Mary. This miraculous conception is sometimes seen as a precursor to the Immaculate Conception, a doctrine that holds that Mary was conceived without original sin. The Protoangelium also describes Mary's childhood and upbringing in the temple. According to the text, when Mary was three years old, her parents dedicated her to the service of God in the temple in Jerusalem. She was raised in a community of virgins and lived a life of piety and devotion. This narrative emphasizes Mary's purity and holiness from an early age, highlighting her special role in God's plan of salvation. The text also provides an account of the betrothal of Mary to Joseph. According to the Proto-Evangelium, when Mary reached the age of 12, the priests decided it was time for her to leave the temple and be betrothed to a suitable man. They called together the eligible men of the tribe of Judah, and by divine intervention, Joseph was chosen as her betrothed. The Proto-Evangelium of James has had a significant impact on Christian art, liturgy, and piety. Many of the details provided in the text have been incorporated into Christian tradition and have influenced the way Mary is depicted in religious art and how her life is commemorated in various feasts and devotions. For example, the Feast of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary celebrated on November 21st commemorates the event of Mary's dedication to the temple, which is based on the account in the Proto-Evangelium. In conclusion, the Proto-Evangelium of James is an apocryphal text that provides details about the early life of the Virgin Mary, her parents, and her childhood. Although not part of the canonical Bible, this text has significantly influenced Christian tradition and devotion to Mary. It offers a narrative that highlights Mary's purity, holiness, and special role in God's plan of salvation from an early age. Despite its historical unreliability, the Proto-Evangelium has shaped the popular imagination and piety surrounding the figure of Mary for centuries. 11. Finally, the Perpetual Virginity of Mary. The doctrine of the Perpetual Virginity of Mary is a belief held by many Christians, particularly in the Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant traditions. It asserts that Mary, the mother of Jesus, remained a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. This doctrine highlights Mary's unique and special role in the history of salvation and emphasizes her purity and dedication to God's plan. The concept of Mary's perpetual virginity is rooted in early Christian writings and tradition. The earliest references to this belief can be found in the writings of the Church Fathers, such as St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and St. Jerome, who defended and promoted the idea that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life. This belief is also reflected in the early creeds and confessions of faith of the Christian Church. The doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary is based on several key theological and scriptural foundations. First, the belief in Mary's virginal conception of Jesus is central to Christian doctrine. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke record that Mary conceived Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, without the involvement of a human father Matthew 1 25 Luke 1 38 This miraculous conception is seen as a sign of Jesus' divine origin and Mary's unique role in God's plan of salvation. Second, the early Christian tradition emphasizes Mary's unique and singular role as the mother of God Theotokos. The title Theotokos, which means God-bearer or mother of God, was affirmed at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD and underscores the belief that Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is both fully divine and fully human. This title highlights Mary's special status and her unique relationship with Jesus. The belief in Mary's perpetual virginity is also seen as a reflection of her total dedication and consecration to God. Her virginity is viewed as a sign of her complete devotion and purity, which sets her apart as a model of holiness for all believers. By remaining a virgin, Mary is seen as embodying the ideal of perfect discipleship and obedience to God's will. The doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary has been the subject of theological debate and discussion throughout the history of the Church. 
Some Protestant traditions, particularly those that emerged during the Reformation, rejected this belief, arguing that it is not explicitly supported by Scripture, and that it contradicts certain biblical passages that mention Jesus' brothers and sisters, e.g., Matthew 13, 55, 56, Mark 6, 3. However, proponents of the doctrine argue that these references can be understood in the context of extended family relationships and do not necessarily imply that Mary had other biological children. Thanks for watching my video. If you find this video helpful with you, please like and share it with your family and friends. See you again, and God bless you.